Hello, BookTube, and welcome to Epic Comic Book Wednesday. This is a weekly of world's finest team-up between Michael K. Vaughn and myself, where we combine the forces of Stately Vaughn Manor and Hyde Cottage to talk about the comic books, which we have wasted our youths. <laughs> and it's, it was Michael's idea. It was, it was a feature on his channel, just looking at the epic collection that Marvel comes out with. He has a ton of them. And I horned my way in. Uh, and said, oh, I want to do that too. <laughs> so, And since I horned my way in, he gets to decide what we're going to do every week. He gets to decide what we're going to pick. And uh, this is not the only comic book video that I've made this week. This is the third one out of three days. So I'm sensing a trend. I'm thinking I'm going to keep up the comic book trend for Thursday and Friday of this week as well. Uh, but be Michael doesn't always pick uh, a particular comic book or a particular epic collection. Sometimes it's a subject. And that's what it is today. It's a conceptual thing. It's, a co it's the subject of continuity in comic books. Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? How have comic books, the two superhero comic book companies, Marvel and DC Comics, how have they dealt with it? And what we're talking about here is the gradual sedimentary effect of publishing the continuous adventures of a character or team over years and then decades. It's, it's a, a question that occurs to some readers, not all readers, but some readers of, well, this adventure that I'm reading now, is it connected to the adventure that I read two years ago? Are these things connected in some way? The minute you start to think that, you are asking questions about continuity. Whether you're talking about DC Comics, the home of real superheroes, or whether you're talking about Marvel Comics, where Stan Lee in the, in the 1960s made a business model out of continuity. He didn't just raise the issue from time to time. He made that the business model of Marvel Comics, that continuity suddenly does matter. Suddenly these comics are connected to each other. All of them are. The minute you start to ask questions about whether or not comic book stories are connected with each other, you're asking questions about continuity. And even in the days of the comics that I like more than I do the present day, continuity was still there. You can't avoid it. Right? Or, uh, there's, a, there's a difference between continuity and amnesia. Once a character is introduced, once Metallo, the man with the kryptonite heart, is introduced in a Superman comic, so he's, he's got a chest plate, and when he opens it, he's got kryptonite for a heart. And kryptonite is deadly to Superman. So Metallo is powered by that kryptonite heart, and Superman can't go anywhere near him. It's a gimmick. It's, Metallo, the man with the kryptonite heart, is a great gimmick. Once he's introduced, fans write in and say, hey, that's a great gimmick. Love to see Metallo again. Okay, fine. The next time Metallo shows up, or Brainiac, or you know Lex Luthor, for that matter, or Dr. Savannah in, in Shazam, the next time Metallo shows up, Superman is going to remember him. He's going to say, oh, it's Metallo, the man with the metal heart, the kryptonite heart. He didn't think that the first time, but he's going to think it in all subsequent times. And... That is the germ of continuity. That is the basic idea of continuity. In the universe in which Superman is a fictional character, that universe has now changed to the point where that character has been introduced and the character of Superman remembers him. That is the basic DNA of continuity. And I would argue that that's all the kind of continuity that you need for your comic books, is that once something has been introduced... Something big has been introduced. It's okay if a writer assumes you remember that something. That's okay. It's certainly preferable to uh, Batman encountering uh, the Gentleman Ghost. And then a year later, Batman and Robin encountering the Gentleman Ghost and saying, who is this guy? That won't work. So a basic level of continuity is necessary. In comics. <laughs> it's, it's, it's only when it's taken too far that it bothers me. And it was never taken too far in DC Comics until Stan Lee made it a business model and introduced into the world of superhero comics what I refer to as the Stan Lee virus, which is not only verisimilitude, it's also continuity. In fact, the two are opposite sides of the same coin. One of the elements of verisimilitude that Stanley introduces into the idea of superhero comic books is that every experience that the superheroes have is something that will play into all new experiences that they have. In other words, they've lived through all of their adventures, the same ones, and they remember all the ones that you remember. 
And you might think that that goes without saying because you are a child of the Stanley virus. You are, you are from an era that was entirely shaped by that. But once upon a time before the Stanley virus, that wasn't true. And it wasn't supposed to be true. It, 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 it wasn't anything that you thought about. If in a, in a classic old Batman comic, if Batman is hiding in the trunk of a car and the villains get word, the gangsters that he's fighting, that he's hiding from, get word that he's in the trunk of the car and they turn their Tommy guns on it and fill it full of hot lead. And then they run away instead of opening the trunk and shooting Batman in the head. They run away and Robin shows up. He opens the trunk and Batman is in there and he's mortally wounded. He's got, he's got bullet holes all over the place. At the end of that issue, Batman, of course, pulls through. He has titanic constitution. So he pulls through and we see him or Robin or both in a hotel at the end of that issue. And they've got their leg up in a cast or they've got bandage wrappings across their naked chest. They still have their masks on. So their identities haven't been revealed. But they're recovering in a hospital from the gunshot wounds that they got in that issue. If you're reading that issue and the next issue of Batman comes out a month later and you haven't been obsessing about the previous issue at all because comic fans didn't exist yet, if the next issue comes out and Batman gets shot again, you do not think, oh boy, this guy's going to spend half his life in the hospital. You don't think about that at all. Batman was shot in that one issue. And see, <laughs> he might be shot in the next issue, but it's not its not continuing over from the last one. There is not supposed to be any verisimilitude beyond Batman in bandages recovering in that hospital bed. The Batman who is shot in the trunk of that car by four gangsters pointing Tommy guns at point blank range would never be the same Batman again. He would certainly never do any kind of crime fighting again. He would be recovering for a year. So there would be no Batman answering the, the bat signal in Gotham City for a year. And when that year was over, the major accomplishment in his life would be that with, bat, with Alfred's help, he is able to climb a flight of stairs at Wayne Manor. Never throws a battering again, never climbs the side of a building again, much less does it in time for the next monthly issue. In other words, there wasn't any verisimilitude. And why? Because there aren't any superheroes in the real world. <laughs> so the idea of pairing them with verisimilitude, the Stan Lee virus, is fundamentally flawed. If you do that, you guarantee that you will reach an untenable position. It might take decades to do, but you guarantee that you will get there. And sure enough, Marvel got there. Marvel Comics introduced this, the Stan Lee virus, and they got there. They got to the point where their own internal continuity, because it was consistent, was untenable. And DC Comics, for some reason, decided to imitate Marvel, only instead of what Marvel... Marvel has done an incremental job with this. Usually, they've done an incremental job with it. So in the original issues of the Fantastic Four, uh, Reed Richards and Ben Grimm were in World War II, right? fighting right alongside Nick Fury. If you're bringing out a comic book starring the Fantastic Four, starring Reed Richards and Ben Grimm in 1975, that can't be true anymore. You just have to quietly edit that out of their character backstory. You, they, it, it doesn't make sense anymore. Same thing with Tony Stark, with Iron Man. If, if he endures an accident during a, a war in, you know, Southeast Asia, <laughs> in, in, in his first appearance as Iron Man, well, in the 1980s, that can't be true anymore, or he would be 100. And so on and so forth, all the way down the line. You can come up, if you're Stan Lee, you can come up with all sorts of gimmicks to get around that. You can say that the Submariner just lives longer. So yeah, he was in World War II comics, but we don't need to revamp continuity for him to be in 1970s comics. We, he just lives longer. He's, he's half human. The other half has a long lifespan, so we can just say that he's in his 70s and is no, none the worse for wear. If you want Captain America to be around, you put him in suspended animation and bring him out of suspended animation. You want the original Human Torch to revive? Well, he's an android. He doesn't age, so... You got, you got a perfect out there. But if you want the other World War II characters to still be around in the 1980s or the 1990s, you're going to have a harder time. Miss America, the Frank, Frank, uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, I want to say Gary Frank, but that's the artist. Bob Frank, the wizard. Uh, they're just ordinary humans who gain temp who gain superpowers and fight during World War II. It doesn't, it isn't realistic that they would still be around. They can be senior citizens in the 1980s, as the wizard was, but they can't be any more than that. Uh, 
But there are loopholes everywhere. Captain America can be in suspended animation. Decades later, his sidekick Bucky can be in suspended animation. The, hu the original Human Torch is an android. He probably doesn't age. The Submariner. Probably you can get out of that. You can come up with an excuse for why Nick Fury is still hale and hearty in the 2000s. But you have to come up with an excuse for it, and Marvel did. Just quietly, they came up with an excuse for it. Same thing with the Super Team. Same thing with the X-Men. They're teenagers in the 1960s. That does not mean that they are collecting retirement benefits in the 1990s. Or the 2020s. It's just that their, their past is quietly elided into later events. DC Comics choose to go a different route. They saw that their continuity was going wild with proliferating alternate worlds and earlier versions of characters and a huge amount of continuity. And they decided on an event called Crisis on Infinite Earths to wipe the slate clean, making a mess of things in the process and also uh, invalidating the reading enjoyment of lots and lots of readers like me who looked at the result of Crisis on Infinite Earths and said, well, okay, but what about all the stories that I loved that obviously can't happen in this new continuity that you've created? What about that? And DC has just kept doing that until I have no idea what the continuity is now. I bet a lot of fans don't. Don't have any idea what the continuity is now in DC Comics. Was there a Justice Society? And if there was, what was it? And what was it like? And does anybody know about it? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. When did Superman first encounter Brainiac? When did Superman... Has Superman ever encountered the bottle city of Kandor? What is the origin of Crypto the Superdog? Who knows? Because DC keeps mucking around with all of that stuff when they shouldn't have. They shouldn't have done it. And Marvel shouldn't have done it either. The proper response to the question of continuity is to ignore it. <laughs> don't have it be involved at all. And don't change the mind frame that expects it. The most you should have for continuity is that if the Avengers fight Kang the Conqueror, the supervillain from the future, in their comic book, in 1962, if Kang returns in 1965, the most gesture of continuity that you want is that the Avengers remember him. That they remember that they fought him before. They're not in 1965 saying, who's this? <laughs> Same way in the old Batman comics or the old Superman comics, if they encounter a villain, they're going to remember that next time. They don't have to remember the details. They don't have to, well, if this was true and he was in Boston on such and such a date, then he couldn't possibly have been, no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. That kind of insanity, that kind of wonkish fanboy insanity is a result of the Stan Lee virus. And the Stanley virus made a business model out of continuity. Got fans hooked in there, in that way. In a way that they it never even occurred to them to think before. Instead, it was, this happened in this issue. Great. That issue's over. Bye. I'm going to go outside and play. <laughs> I'm going to drink water out of the garden hose. I'm not going to die. <laughs> I'm going to go outside and play. I'm going to come back for supper at night. <laughs> but I'm, I'm going to be gone all day. My parents aren't going to know where I am. I'm going to be gone all day. I'm going to go out and play. And then next month, when there's another comic... Well, somebody's older brother will have a copy, or I will go to the dime store and get one. And I won't concern myself with the exact minutia of what happened in the previous issue, or an issue a year ago. Before Stan Lee introduced the Stan Lee virus, that attitude towards comics continuity would have been viewed by comic book fans as lunacy. <laughs> it's just, there's something wrong with you. Now, I'm, I, I realize that I'm, I'm barking up the wrong tree because that version of comic book continuity and verisimilitude has won the day. I'm perfectly willing to admit that. Nobody does comics the way I'm talking about anymore, and no one ever will. So we have to deal with continuity now, and uh, I said at the time, <laughs> or rather my great-grandfather did, since of course I'm only 28, so I don't remember these days, but my great-grandfather at the time said, you know, among the many other things that are wrong with verisimilitude and continuity as they are done in this new Marvel, among the many other things that's wrong with this is that this is going to start to create a litmus test for new fans. The more you build on this stuff instead of saying it doesn't matter. If you say that it does matter. If you say that what happened in, in that issue in 1961 matters in 1965. You're ruling out. You're shutting the door in the face of the fans who wasn't, weren't reading your comic book in 1961. Or maybe don't remember it. And can't find an issue of it. Don't know what happened in that issue. You're slamming the door in their face. You're saying, well, the people who understand this will get it. Uh, the people who've been following along and keeping notes will get it. The other people won't. Uh, 
I, my great grandfather at the time probably said that's a bad idea. That's going to require you to course correct regularly in order to get those fans back. And that is the reason why DC Comics has done its multiple massive continuity rewrites. There was Crisis on Infinite Earth. There was uh, the New Fifty Two was a big one that that had disastrous results. But they've had you know uh, Infinite Crisis, Dark Crisis, Midlife Crisis. I have no idea how many crises there have been. They do them regularly, and I have always maintained. The, the the best way, the the best crisis event that DC should do, mega multi-issue tie-in, pulling in all the current comics from their continuity, the best crisis event that they could do, let's say this summer, would be, to, they've already had Final Crisis, and they've had crises after that, so it's kind of an in-joke now. But the best thing that they could do would be to do a crisis mega event that undoes all the other Crisis Mega events, especially Crisis on Infinite Earths, that out undoes them all and says all of those previous continuities, all of those previous versions of reality, they all exist again. And we're trusting that if an eight-year-old can keep track of them and have a fun time buying our comics, then all of you adult weirdos can as well. It's all true, is what we're going to say. It's all true. We're going to invalidate all of the dumb events from all of these Crisis events and just go back to the way things were. That would be the best thing that they could do, but they're not going to do it. <laughs> they're not going to do it. And I guess there's a vocal minority of fans that, for whom that worked. I mean, I know that the New 52, for instance, brought DC Comics a lot of new readers. And I think I remember that Crisis on Infinite Earths did too. Am I remembering correctly that Michael K. Vaughn was one of those readers? That it worked for him. I would argue that that the thinking of those new readers was never, oh, this was a really complicated backstory, but now that it's been simplified, now I will start reading. I would argue that it was never that simple. I would argue that those new readers, I don't deny that the, these events bring in new readers, but I think it's more that they feel invited in, rather than that they feel that the previous continuity was too complex for them to figure out. I think it's just, uh, they like the clean slate feel of it. What are you going to build on from here? That was certainly true with the New 52. A lot of the new fans that came on there were saying, you know, I was a fan of the old Wonder Woman, or the old Superman, but I want to see what you'll do with this new continuity. That that was it was an open door invite. It was the opposite of saying, well, you know, this issue in 1971 is entirely born out of a small piece of trivia from an issue in 1968. So if you don't know that, there's not much I can do to help you. The the big crisis continuity rewrites for DC Comics were the opposite of that. And I guess they had the desired effect, but uh, you all knew where I was going to come down on this issue. I'm not a fan of verisimilitude in superhero comic books. I'm not a fan of the kind of continuity that says that if you're going to read issue number 1015, you had better have read issue number 981. I, 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 that was never true before Stan Lee, and now, not except in its most basic level, it was never true. Once Supergirl is introduced, okay, she's part of continuity. But you don't have to know every little detail <laughs> of her. You just have to know, now that she's introduced, we know she exists. Those were the kinds of continuity changes that I had no objection to. <sighs> Whether or not, like for instance, right, if I had to ask you, you Marvel fans out there, if I asked you right now, off the top of your head, without consulting anything, right now in Marvel Comics, can Ben Grimm change into the thing voluntarily or is he trapped in a monster's body without checking anything can you tell me where in the continuity roller coaster he is right now i bet you couldn't tell me and that's bad you shouldn't that shouldn't be true you shouldn't need a cabalistic understanding of these things in order to enjoy them fully but continuity is here to stay i'm sure that i haven't watched Michael K. Vaughn's video yet on the subject he has a job he has a life so he has to make his videos first thing in the morning uh, I'm sure that it's up. If it is, I'll link to it. But I'd be willing, I think I remember him saying that he felt that invitation. He felt invited by, I think it was Crisis on Infinite Earth. If he's that old? Oh my God, is he that old? <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm pretty sure that he's more of a fan of this sort of thing than I am. And I, I'm partially tongue-in-cheek here because a lot of these continuity revamps have led to interesting or even good stories. There are a couple of genuinely good moments in the New 52 even considering the disaster that largely arose from it, there are some great moments in Crisis on Infinite Earths and great artwork by George Perez uh, and some 
good stuff that came after. Not much, but some. <laughs> the George Perez Wonder Woman, for instance. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> it's, this is a, a comic book concept subject. The subject of continuity. And since it's a subject, instead of individual issues that you either have read or haven't read, here I can open it up to you, which I don't always get to do. What do you think of this? Are you perhaps one of those people who has felt, oh my god, I would get, I would jump on board and start reading the X-Men, but it's such a tangled backstory, I wouldn't know where to begin. If you are such a reader, have you felt invited by slate cleaning events? Here is a jump on point. When, like for instance, if you look at new comics when they're advertised or in a catalog or something, and a new comic, periodically a new comic will introduce itself as a perfect jump on point for new fans. When you see that, do you feel like that's you? You feel like that's talking to you? Does that is that an extra draw for you? I'd love to hear about it. I'd love to hear your thoughts on comic continuity. Any of you comic book fans that are out there, and it's the comic book fans who will be watching what appears to be a rash of comic book content on this channel. Because I'm a weak-willed eight-year-old, basically speaking, and if I did a comic book video on Monday, and one on Tuesday, and now one on Wednesday, you can bet I'm going to keep doing it. So you you just wait and you'll get a comic video tomorrow. But in the meantime, I'm going to wrap this up. A subject of continuity. Are my comments today in line with what I said in 2017? I'd better check. <laughs> a vexed subject on which Michael and I do not completely agree. Uh, but we'll see what he picks for next week. <laughs> so I'll see you then. Thank you, BookTube.